And so a part of what you're describing is the way that your youthful curiosity, observations of others led to you figuring it out. Mm-hmm. I remember, um, so I had an uncle, right? So we 15 years apart. I have an uncle. He was the one who I wanted to be most like. Mm-hmm. So like my grandparents lived next door. So it was me, my mama, then my grandmother, my grandfather, and all my uncles. And then, you know, my grandmother's house is like that house where like people would descend upon that crib for everything, mm-hmm. all holidays, everything else. You needed a place to stay. So in the summertime, cousins all over the place, my aunties upstairs, you know, they walking around in the morning in their house coats, seven o'clock in the morning, you, you can smell that good breakfast. So it right. was that house. But my uncle, he was born in 60, so I'm born in 75. So he was the baby of the siblings. Mm-hmm. And I'm like the last one, you know what I'm saying? And in my eyes, as a little boy, there was really no, like, there was no wrong he could do. You know what I'm saying? Because he was that dude. Right. He, like, the nigga could step, Chicago step, and he could yeah, dress, yeah, he could yeah. skate. Yeah. You know, you well, you from Cleveland, you know, like, yeah. all these things. Yeah, so, all he could do all them things. And it's funny because, like, I would watch him and I would always think to myself, like, who, who taught him how to do it? You know? <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I know he so picked, cool. yeah, he just like, who taught you this cool? Right. But I'd be looking at my granddaddy and I'm just like, well, well, I know he probably picked up these things, but yeah. I'm like, with well, this other stuff, where'd he get this stuff from? Yeah. And it's like, it was almost all, you know, through kind of like just social influence and all, but, but no one directly said, well, this is how you're going to be able to do this. Like, it. It's, it was his process of figuring it out. Yeah. Then I mimicked a lot of what it is that he did over time. But for all the stuff that I, you know, when I was growing up, I'm just like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, ain't nobody really taught him to be that cool. Yeah. I used to think that about those kids who could flip. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Gymnastics, yeah. they just did it. They just did it. They made yeah. a way out of no representation and still did yeah. it. Yeah. But I, I do think that it, it has something mm-hmm. to do with that desire, right? Mm-hmm. Like the observation of cool, and you want it, and so you practice it, mm-hmm. you know? And that's a part of the instruction, but it's rooted in desire. That's why, I mean, I had to figure out that that was undesirable, mm-hmm. right? What like was that, undesirable? To be cool. Where I lived, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. That the, mm-hmm. ambition, the ambition wasn't to live on my block. Mm. I mean, that my education was to have a house that was far beyond where I lived. Mm. Because it took me a long time because I did associate my family and my life with desirability and with cool. Mm. I, didn't associate, I didn't understand that I lived in the inner city. You know, so when my teachers would talk about that, I was like, ooh. You know, like, I don't want to be Right, right, with this place. <laughs> right. It's looking at you like, shell. no, that's actually, um. So one day, <laughs> one day I'm in school and I realize, like, damn, that's supposed to be my house. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and that's when I realized my <laughs> teachers didn't know what they were talking about. Mm. That was my first indication huh. that these people have no idea. And for the rest of my life, I thought, my job is to prove it. Hmm. Right, to prove, not necessarily to them, but to prove what I understood about the value of my life and of the people who I admired and who I strive to be like, that that was real, hmm. right? That my understanding of intellectual work came from that place. You know, because my house was your house, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And my grandfather, I, t- I write about this and I talk about it a lot, but he would sit in a room we call the TV room and mm-hmm. he never turned it on. But he would sit there for hours and look out the window. Mm-hmm. And I would ask, you know, what are you thinking about? Mm-hmm. And he'd say, girl, one of my thoughts will bust your brain wide open. <laughs> and you know, I'm watching Looney Tunes. I'm like, damn, mm-hmm. this might actually happen. But what could that be? Right. So for the rest of my life, I've been chasing those explosive ideas. Mm. What could that be like? Mm. Right? And, you know, my grandfather's World War II diary was in Mm. the Bible, right? Mm. Of my family Bible. And it was amazing to me that during the war, he would stop and write things down. And one of those observations was about these white boys who burned a barn. And he writes, why would they do, what would be the point of that? You already won, hmm. right? I mean, in the middle of a war, 
But then you want to talk about the inner city. No, I come from that. Mm -hmm. You know, that ability to sit down and recognize that you have access to enough. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That shaming people and attempting to deny the defeated dignity Mm -hmm. was not something that he wanted to be a part of. So, like, recognizing the wealth of that um, is something that I consider to be an inheritance. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to figure out how you get to be that good. Mm. You know? Yeah. Um, But these same people who can't innovate, they also can't see that. Right. But that's their limitation. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. You know? Mm. You, um... You ran track. I did. And played ball. And played ball, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I played ball, so I hooped all the way up to age 28. Mm-hmm. I had the opportunity to play a little bit in Mexico. And I stopped short of even pursuing it further than that because, and actually I was sitting on a colleague of mine a couple of days ago. She was like, well, why don't you play more? I said, because I recall being in a practice. Mm-hmm. And by that point, I think I might have been about maybe 12 credits away from getting my second master's degree. And I knew the coach didn't have as much formal education as I did, but mm. I was going to be the one that was on, on the line running these sprints. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I think I'm done. Now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, mm-hmm. But the thing that intrigues me most, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this in terms of being an athlete, mm-hmm. but it's still in terms of black physicality, but the thing that I would always think about, especially like now, so you, you got all the um, hoopla around Shakari Richardson or whatever, yeah. and, you know, whatever that she says or doesn't say. Right. The Jamaican team or whatever. Um, you know, even a young brother, uh, Wilder, who just lost a boxing yeah. match. Mm-hmm. But I'm always thinking about black physicality in a sense with respect to sport. Now, being in academia, because I ask myself basic questions. I said, well, do you actually think a coach taught this young black girl to run fast? Right. Yeah. Do you think a coach mm-hmm. actually taught Jordan to jump as high as he could. Mm -hmm. Do you think a coach actually gave, you know, Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker or Barry Sanders the ability to be able to do as much as they could, you know, Mm -hmm. on a football field? Like, do you think they were coached to do that? And I'm and I always come back with no. No. We're talking raw, given ability and talent, timing, speed. You know what some folks to some degree may say exists in the realm of the supernatural. Yeah. My problem with this is is simple, because if we look at like the history of the black body, you know whether it was to push, pull, lift, mm-hmm. climb, build, hammer, hit, you know, mm-hmm. screw. Mm-hmm. My problem is has always been, with respect to the refinement of the process, it's always converted to some realm of whiteness, mm-hmm. as it relates to the exceptional aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Oh, the his game. Is so fundamental. Oh, you know, have you seen Venus and Serena? Because they're so fundamentally sound. They do this, but, but, but the accolade may not be given to their father. Yeah. It may be given to some other yeah. part of the evolution yeah. that they've experienced when yeah. they came across this other individual who may not look like Richard Williams. Yeah. And then I come back with something very, very simple, especially with respect to this. It's like, okay, well, I don't think many of us, in terms of like really acknowledging the power of the of black physicality, have set and just, you know, and, and just really just frozen for a moment to say, this has always been us. Yeah. This has always been us. And not only has it always been us, no matter what class that they try to construct mm-hmm. or what type of modality that they try to put together in terms of saying, well, you know, this is our program and we produce this many champions, this many mm-hmm. NCAA, this, no matter what it is they try to produce, at the mm-hmm. end of the day, you couldn't do this unless, to your point, that we were able to find this type of innovation Mm-hmm. you know, going way back before. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I am very interested in intrinsic motivation in black people, mm-hmm. right? I mean, um, that sort of in, intrinsic investment in seeing good that I noted in my grandfather. Mm-hmm. But also, Michael Jordan not making the basketball team and, like, working to mm-hmm. get on the team. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like people have said, you know, his mother didn't call to come. You know, and my son gets an opportunity. He work. He went back to right. work, right? Everyone, because I've been watching the Ken Burns, and I have to admit that 
you know, once we get past, once we get to the Joe Frazier era, I have a hard time because I don't want to see the brother lose. Even though I understand that that's a part of his greatness, mm -hmm. is how Ali faced the truth. But everybody who would see Ali as he was coming up would note that he wasn't impressive as a boxer. What was impressive was how hard he would work mm -hmm. in order to put himself in a position to win. Mm -hmm. So it's that intrinsic motivation again. That is what is of interest to me, as well as the way that that intrinsic motivation and that excellence always highlights the lie that we're, as a nation, interested in the best. Mm -hmm. Because if you were interested in the best, you wouldn't have tried to kill Ali. Right? You wouldn't have stopped black jockeys. You wouldn't have had a Negro League baseball. Oh, so you're interested in controlling the best. That's what you're interested yes, in doing. Yeah. It's always that one story about slavery and controlling mm -hmm. the black body. Mm -hmm. That's what you're concerned with. You're yeah. not concerned with being the best. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. That's a lie. So if you want to be the best, what black people have to understand is that that has to come from you. Oh, without question. <laughs> Because, because it's a lie to say that that's what this country wants. I mean, that's true with Chicago. So, you know, and it's funny because, and I'm, this is probably going to be the second time I'm going to get this on record, but a lot of people don't know, like, my trajectory in terms of being an athlete, wanting no part of anything that looked like nerdedom, mm -hmm. like no part of scholarship and all the other stuff, whatever, so... And it was stuff that I could do, and mother would say, okay, but you do just enough just to get by. Mm -hmm. But you could do so much more. But by the time I actually evolved to want to do that thing, I realized that, oh, okay, well, I could have done this all along and never had to be an either or. It could have been a both and. Yeah. So, but, but in terms of the trajectory, one thing that I would always know, especially with respect to my coaches coming up as a young person, I had, had mainly white coaches. Mm -hmm. And I've even had Same. black, yeah, even had black coaches who begged me not to go to certain places because they didn't want me to play for certain white coaches, mm -hmm. not necessarily because they couldn't coach, because they knew that those coaches that I was going to play for would not be able to integrate me into their system because I had too much pride. Well, I didn't get it, though. Yeah. So then I realized, I was like, you know, as an adult, it's like, oh, they can spot when little black girls are proud of themselves. Yeah, yes. Oh, we yeah. saw it with uh, Venus and Serena, Serena with that yeah. interview when Daddy had to come in and exactly. he was like, she said what she said. Yeah, Why exactly. Why are you pressing yeah. it? Right. Yeah. And I was like, oh, they can spot when little black boys are proud. That's it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. and that's break you. And they'll listen. And so, yeah. Again, to that the, point, that story, to that, that story, that slavery story. That's it. So you don't really want to see the best. That's you want to control, control the best. If you can't, you would you would try to destroy it. That's it. So my granddaddy. So I played for this coach, Isaiah Thomas' is old coach, okay. the Hoop Dream coach. Yeah. This little Italian white man that I played for for three years. I remember my, you know, because people would always say, like, why are you always giving you a hard time? Like, why is it always this and always that? Now, I'm a child. Yeah. You don't even realize you're a child at the time because I'm 16. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> you're a child. You're right. You're a child. Exactly. So I'm a child. So my granddaddy would fight those battles. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's a Meridian, Mississippi old man, World War II vet or whatever, you know. But but them old men that, you know, they had presence. Yeah. You know, like Chris Rock would say, like, them old Negroes, are like, they, they can get shot, take a bullet out that same that's night. It. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, build a house from scratch. That's right. That's right. That's like, I don't have none of them skills. So, but, but, but my granddaddy, though, he would always say, he said, do you, do you ever wonder why I do this with you every day? And I'm like... No, I don't know why we go over this. He was like, well, do you want to while after on these days we go to this gym and work on this all the time? I was like, I just figured we was practicing. He said, mm -mm. He said, well, we're doing that. He said, but we do these things with ritual because I want to make sure that this person never breaks your spirit. That's it. Come on. That's it. And I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. Now, as an adult man, I turned 46 today. That still brings me to tears. Now, now. I think about this in the context of what we're talking about with respect to celebrating the black body, movement, sound, and everything else, because when I think about some of the things that like literally bring me joy, playing sport brought me joy. Watching young people learn brings me joy. Shit, listening to brilliant sisters like y'all, like that brings me joy. And then I think to myself, okay, well, they picked up things here and there. I watched shorties on the block hooping, pick up things. You know, this is the fastest cat on the block, whatever. Like, nobody taught him how to run. He was just fast. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I get a kick out of all of that. Mm -hmm. And then I also really, really get a kick out of, you know, seeing those things that I know that no one really taught these young people do, but uh, but they do it with excellence. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, that's just brilliant to me. Mm -hmm. And then even more brilliant when you see it done in such a way that they can, if they ever develop pride and then understanding of self, mm -hmm. where they're able to retain it, where no one breaks that spirit, and then they're able to not only carry that throughout their career, but then you mm -hmm. see it almost mature in such a way where you're like, wow, they're like that that's the best of the best for us. Yeah. 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 And yeah. To me that's why it's spiritual work that we're doing. Oh man, come on, Shell. You know come on. I mean it really is because I, I do feel like that that's the holy. I mean this hmm. sort of encounter mm -hmm. with what we're talking about as an intrinsic motivation or the excellence. I mean, like, that is the encounter with the divine, you know, and I'm interested in sort of what happens when you are invested in not breaking it, but in trying to nurture it, which is a part of what is so wonderful about being in an all-black space, right? Mm -hmm. So I was saying to students, one, one, the first time I gave black papers, right? And, I mean, these were the worst papers I ever read, like, as a group, especially for, like, advanced students. I mean, like, awesome, okay? And, um, but a part of what I was trying not to do, and I explained to them, like, I'm trying not to do, like, I'm trying to find anything possible to salvage this essay and to save it, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the students, you know, of course, the students I teach is my AP, my IB teacher, you know, like she would have said, you know, you just stop reading. So then I say to them, but that's not why you come here, because a part of why you come here <laughs> is because... I'm not looking to destroy black women, right? I'm not looking to dismiss you. What did I just say? I'm looking to find any good in this. I'm looking for your salvation. So we can build you up. That's what I'm trying to do, right? I'm not trying to destroy you. That's not the work. So, right, like I so said, today I'm going through, okay, now I, we found some A's and some B's in here, but as I'm going through them, okay, this wrong, this ain't right, but she had the spirit of what this is supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? So a part of what I'm trying to teach, and I like I love Bell Hooks' as Loving Blackness as Political Resistance. Mm -hmm. That is the must essay that you have to read as Feldman for me. Mm -hmm. So as I say to them, and anybody white who wants me to talk about race, I don't do race, I do loving blackness. That's right, that's right. I don't do, race is about some antagonism with some white people. That's y'all, that's for you. Loving blackness is, that's, that's a very different enterprise, right? That's what happens beyond grievance. Mm. So at you know in an HBCU that's about homecoming Come on. and and fried chicken Wednesdays and sisterhood and all of those things that we know that have nothing to do with trying to prove something to some white folks. Mm. But what happens when those kids show up is they're not versed in that. So like those students in Bell Hooks' essay, when she asks them, when she points out that this woman in this novel passing mm -hmm. was willing to die. Right? In order to love blackness. And it was so dangerous of an idea that she had to die. Mm. Those students could only talk about the pain of blackness. So our job is to make sure that we have students who could talk about loving blackness as sustaining life. Right? Yeah. I want to, um, before we continue, I just want to stop and introduce these folk. <laughs> this, is, this is what how we do. And this is especially how I do um, think tanks of trying to um, figure out works, pieces of art. I talk to my people. Um, these are phenomenal radical scholars who um, have been proven to make stars. We make stars because we don't break spirits. Um, this is Dr. Richard Benson. Uh, what, what department are you in? Education? Mm -hmm. At Spelman College. Um, Google him. <laughs> We'll put the link and all the things in the description. You need to know him. Purchase his books. And over here, okay. we have Dr. Michelle Height. Dr. Michelle Height, another colleague at Spelman in the English department, the HNIC of the honors department. And I'm T. Lang. <laughs> okay. Google Michelle, Dr. Height. Get all her books. Read all her essays. Know these people. Oh, man. Um, so I brought them here um, because I'm experimenting um, 
on new methods and directions and approaches to create movement that no longer exhausts the black body, that um, allows the movement to hypnotize and put you in trance to transcend and transform your thinking, your perspective. I'm interested in shifting gears and looking at movement as meditation. I am interested in seeing movement as meditation for several, several reasons. Again, not to exhaust the, the, the black body, um, but also thinking about um, reparations, reconciliation, repair for those who have been in dominant spaces or gaze. How, how, can, how, can, how can we, how can I help you atone and see me and black bodies as human, but also divine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking um, since the last work in 2020 was Out From The Deep, a meditation for the Turners. It was a work that I finally um, um, pushed the envelope and put the work, um, centered the work in augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, other dimension. Um, I needed that platform to A, feel safe and to feel real. Mm. Hmm. Um, and I'm hooked. <laughs> I like, I've always been playing with technology, but going in this direction, entering in this, um, this, this field, um, this void, um, I'm digging. And I need my folks to um, come to the table and help me see things that I'm not able to see and understand things that are there, but um, I need the presence of God to help me pull mm -hmm. it out. And I call the divine folk. Um, I've been thinking um, of these words as themes, um, brass, wind, hot tongues, and committed to use this title and find anagrams and codes inside of it to create new or uh, other iterations. So then I eventually I can string these movement of meditations for you all. It also um, is allowing me to collaborate and push the envelope um, even further um, where I'm working with um, Grammy Award winning artist Kevin Williams, um, a tenor saxophonist and his band, The Wolfpack, and, um, and bringing in other collaborators to the mix. Of course, we've still got the Avengers, we're still working with Blacklight uh, Productions, Andre Allen Blacklight Productions, still working with our boy, our homeboy, and our, my little big brother, Tori Best, um, with sound um, composition. And I brought back all of um, T-Lang dancers who have worked with me throughout the years in the company, but also as students at Spelman College and students at the American Dance Festival. I brought them back and I made out a call for citizens, former dancers, former models, aged from 21 to 60 plus to come and join in this process with me. Um, so you are, you all have um, a seat at our table to hear our think tank and how to get this thing thinging. Um, and as they're talking, as I am um, uh, share the, the, the impetus of the work and the idea and the intention of the work, then I, I sit back and I listen and I jot down things that are, um, that resonate and connect to the work. And then from there, I'm able to say and feel or understand how divine is speaking to me mm -hmm. through them, um, how to put this thing together and have it more cohesive and make it make sense. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope you all enjoy um, how we do this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And back to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
But, you know, I mean, too, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, again, about our grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of exhaustion, I was telling the students today that my grandfather used to, like, marvel at the fact that I would buy tennis shoes when my mother would give me money for shoes, right? And he would, like, make a, like, that was, like, the story. You know, like, this girl buys shoes, buy tennis shoes, or he would say sneakers. In the way in the world I ever buy sneakers if my mother gave me money. Oh, and so to the point of telling them to be quiet, I was saying to the students, I never said to him, why? You know, or like, oh, these shoes. I never said anything. I just sat with it. And later in repose, what I understood was that if he had bought those shoes, then he could have been, then he could have been put to work doing things that those shoes were made for, mm -hmm. like physical labor. Mm -hmm. Whereas if he bought dress shoes, mm -hmm. then he would have been less likely to have been exerted in the way that you're talking about. So I think the sort of myth about those, you know, um, old Southern black men who seemed like they could do anything mm -hmm. was that that they were all John Henry's in the, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, they were all just kind of, they would work themselves to death. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, at least I could see in that story about those shoes ways that he was trying to buy himself some time for a, a pause. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. You know? Because um, that's what that was about. Not exhausting himself. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Exhaustion. You know. I remember when uh, <laughs> I was, uh, so as an undergrad, I did a few years in Wisconsin, and I got kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. Then just running around doing, you know, whatever in Chicago for about almost three years. Then going back to a, a junior college, and I was determined to get my grades up. To get to get back into a four year because I wanted to play ball for a couple more years, and I recall um, that time in the junior college, I was um, working for Montgomery Wards hmm. in furniture customer service or furniture repair for customer service. So I would get the phone. I was in the department. I would get the phone calls where you know folks needed their recliners fixed, couches, and things of this nature that they purchased from Wards. Um, and for those who may not be familiar, Montgomery Wards wants a furniture department store, yes. whatever, at the mall, which is now defunct. They went bankrupt, I want to say, toward the late 90s. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to school every day but Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I'm working every day but Tuesday because mm -hmm. I was just below full time in terms of hours, so they wouldn't have to pay me benefits. And I recall that, that Tuesday off from going to class and Tuesday off from going to work, I would kind of, you know, I would do, either do a little bit of work or catch up on reading or whatever. Like, I was determined to, like, to get so many hours of A mm -hmm. in order to get back into a four-year institution. So my grandmother living next door, you know, my mother was at work. She would come by and straighten up some things, help my mom out or whatever. But my grandmother was one of those persons who, from Macomb, Mississippi, was always working. Mm -hmm. So, Shell, T, I had Tuesdays off. Mm -hmm. So my grand grandmother would come by. If I'm in the house or whatever, I might be watching an old karate flick or something, and she'd be like, you ain't have to work today? I'm like, uh, no, nah, my dear, um, um, I'm off from work. Off? You still got your job? Yeah, but I got my, got my job, but just, I don't work today. Right. Too, too. She was like, oh, okay. Well, you ain't got class? Mm -mm, no classes today. You ain't got no class? You ain't got no work? Mm -hmm. Well, you could have got you another little job or something. <laughs> Yeah. Sure, you could have got you another little job. Yeah. And I was, and then it hit me. Rest. What you, rest? Yeah. What you mean? Yeah. What, no. Yeah. You yeah. rest when it's time to go to bed. Okay. It's like sleep and rest were conjoined. Yeah. Rest yeah. is like, no. Yeah. And then it hit me. I was like, oh, wow. This is like literally an ingrained cultural phenomenon yes. Yes. around work. Yeah. And if you don't look like, you been grave digging or you near death when you come home from work 
then you didn't work. Because yeah. my grandmother was always quick to tell us we was in the yard. Oh, you ain't doing over that. Ain't no work. That's it. They don't know. Yeah. You ain't done no work. You ain't well, done but put up a couple of weeds or whatever. That ain't no real work. But how about when you work in the academy and they don't get that whole Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Tuesday, Thursday schedule? Like, what you mean you can't? You ain't got to go in. What, what was going on? Wait. Get, they don't understand how you get money. How do you get? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Listen. And wait, sick, and not even the old folk, but even folk who are peers. That's right. Oh yeah, I was God. telling, I was telling my colleagues out in Boston, like, yeah, y'all, you know, I'm Tuesday, Thursday. From they like Tuesday, Thursday, what? Tuesday, Thursday, what? Exactly. I said, Tuesday, exactly. Thursday. Yes. You're turning the big red. My office hours are. That's right. They, they don't That's get right. it. They don't, mm -hmm. get it. they don't get it. They don't get it. And then it hit me, and I always talk to my students about this, and I always encourage Anyone who has the time to go check out the movie Margin Call, um, okay. big names, Kevin Spacey, um, uh, Kevin Spacey, uh, is it Hugh Laurie? Not Hugh Laurie. Uh, Jeremy Irons, Demi, oh, wow. Demi Moore. Margin uh, Calls? Margin Call. It's about, it's, it's like moments before the great real estate debacle crash of 08 coming into 09 or whatever, when, you know, they realized that all the stuff that they had had no value, so they had to dump it. Mm -hmm. So there are mm -hmm. several scenes in which um, I'm, I'm arrested to because they remind me that I, A, I don't know anything about wealth building. Mm -hmm. B, I know nothing about real money, yeah. like real, real money. Yeah. And C, I don't really understand the culture around those who are in positions of ownership and rulership. Yeah. So there's a couple of scenes, but one in particular... Uh, this guy, he's um, he's a young guy, entry level, and he is one who's being kept on because, like, by the hour, they're literally slashing their personnel. Mm -hmm. So this guy who's, um, so Kevin Spacey is playing one of the higher up CEOs or something. Mm -hmm. And they're, like, working literally around the clock. And the younger guy, younger white guy, he catches him outside on a smoke break and he said, well, you know, hey, Mr. So-and-so, um, you know, just glad I can be here to help out and, you know, try to work things through. So I know you've been working hard and everything else. And, uh, you know, I'm just, just hope we can turn things around. <laughs> Kevin Spacey turns, looked at him, he said, working hard? What makes you think I've been working hard? <laughs> he said, I'm not working hard. Mm -hmm. you working, you're, you're working much harder than I am. <laughs> he said, no, that's, that's not how this works. Mm -hmm. He said, but, but you'll, you'll get it over time. Yeah. And then it hit me. I was like... Even he's admitting I'm not working hard at anything. Right. I'm here to collect this bread. Yeah. Y'all right. the ones that's gonna work hard. That's it. And then it and then with that, I'm just like, right, because that's the general approach to how many of us are treated or subjected mm -hmm. to in the overall realm of our labor. Yeah. We're working thinking that eventually that it'll amount to Jeff Bezos. That's yeah. it. And it's like, no, that's some, that's that's, a, that's, that's hard, underclass so consciousness. Yeah. We're not working. Like, yeah. well, we can work as hard as we want. These yeah. individuals understood the game, you know, centuries yeah. ago. No, they're working smart to position themselves to benefit and capitalize off of your labor. That's what I think about the black body and movement. Yeah. Uh-huh. Beat Street. Uh -huh. Yeah. Breaking. Uh -huh. Electric Boogaloo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, the one before that, uh, Wild Style. Uh -huh. All that. I'm just like. Hell, mother, mother. Come on, stuff. come on, yeah. I, I, come on. I got them dancers dancing. Yeah. Come on. It, it, with injury. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, yeah. it comes to a point where you got to work smarter. Yeah. yeah. Not no, harder. That. Because they, because they still don't care. No, 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 no. You won't get the recognition. So yeah. Just be smart with how you approach your things. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that was the thing. Like, unlike you, I didn't enjoy sports. I enjoy winning. Mm. Um, I enjoy the glory, but mm -hmm. I never liked exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And the thing about like track is that you hear yourself breathing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and cause the thing, you know, and I am enjoying Kim Burns, but the thing that I always want to know about boxers is what it sounds like inside their head. Um, you know, like all that road work, all that extended time by yourself. Like, what did you, what was that like? I mean, and you're talking hours. And you know they have so many hours of ring time well, listen, to prepare for 12 well, that hours. That too, but y'all, they also have to transform into a monster that they don't like. <clears> they, <throat> that shadow work that they had to put aside and do the training to get That's the light. Right. But they got to bring that, all of that chatter, all mm. that shadow into the ring. Mm. And to think about, you know, you have to be quick. It's chess that you're doing, yeah. right? Yeah. 
chess with light and shadow. Yeah. Yes. I could not even imagine Split second movement, being in the brain and, and, during that time. Well, and that's the thing, like, as a runner, I mean, you know, one of the things that I would do to calm my nerves is say, well, at least I'm not going to die, right? Like, mm. nobody's going to kill me. Mm. You can't say that in boxing. Yeah. I used to uh, do boxing training over in the West End, like, right off of um, uh, Daniel, McDaniel Street. Mm-hmm. It's right around the corner from campus, really. So they still over there. It's called a uh, sweatshop. It's a cat named oh, the cat named Willie. He's trained me, and um, at one point he would have to go train. At, it was kind of like a, a Atlanta Police Department like mm-hmm. gym or whatever. Not uh, over in um, in Bankhead. Mm-hmm. So I meet him over in Bankhead. We train. So a couple times they had some sparring, mm-hmm. and they brought in. A couple Cuban boxes. Mm. So they brought in one, and he was fighting against one of Willie's boxes, a young guy. So they sparred maybe about three rounds. Mm-hmm. So if the ring, so the ring is by where your seat is, mm-hmm. and I'm standing, you know, on the outside, and you can hear, you can like literally, it sounded like thunder and lightning, like bam, bam. Because you know that's my drink. My, I like one of my like bucket list for me is going to a boxing match because I've never been in the room. I'll take arena. You. I really, I literally want to go. I'll take, I'll take go. one. I'll take one. Go. So I'm literally. I'm, so say, so y'all, I'm standing y'all. there and I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god, is you, that what that sound? Thunder like? and lightning. Wow. In 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 Willie's box is in the corner and the Cuban cat hit him like you can hear like bow bow. Uh, Willie like. Cover up, cover yeah. up, and I'm, I'm I'm outside the ring like cover up, <laughs> <He's a pink laughs> cover up, cover up. Oh, wow! Because you can hear it, and, and and in my mind I'm like I couldn't imagine getting hit with them shots. About what class were they? Both of them probably around 190, 195 oh. pounds, and I'm just like, I mean you can That's hear it. Hot. So the Cuban cat when they come out now, mind you, this the Cuban boxer, he got about two hundred and like seventy fights under his belt as an amateur. Oh. Because you know how that thing goes yeah. in Cuba, whatever. A lot of them, they just defect the term pro. Yeah. So the Cuban cat, in his broken English, he was saying, he was like, yeah, you know, had a good spar with him, yeah, you know, the other day. Hit me real hard. He's like, you know, um, I had to, you know, like really get some rest because my head was ringing for like two days. Oh. And I'm like, that's, that, that's not normal. <laughs> that's not normal. Right. And I'm just like, man, cats used right. to do this to eat. To yeah. eat. To yeah. eat. Food to on the eat. table. I was like, man, That's it. That's I'm going to stick with this skip and rope. I'm going to hit this bag. <laughs> over the table. He'd be like, Rich, you want to? I'm like, no. I'm cool. I'm right. I got to use this thing. Yeah. For all this shit I be talking. I need this but, little not, but, brain. But that's it. Like, you know, when you understand that, like, when we're watching a match, Come on. we are seeing, like, snippets, but... They live through the seconds of the minutes of the hours that it takes to, to fight. And then with boxing, it, going through the training, you appreciate what split second timing looks like. Listen. So, like, you know, obviously as a choreographer, as a trainer, yeah. as a dancer, when you when you need everything in perfect calibration and you know yeah. with every step, like to the naked eye, it's like, oh, you know, that was just a step. And it's like, no, we've had to practice that shit this many <laughs> hours all the time in order right. to get that. That's it. And it's like with that boxing thing, it's like, okay, they've gone through so much of the routine with the shadow mm-hmm. box and whatever, slipping punches and roll work and everything mm-hmm. else. And, and all of that training has gone into his ability to slip this one punch and not get his head knocked That's off. It. And it's very intentional. And you just like, wow, I have yeah. a great, even greater appreciation because... Imagine having to do that and you so tired you can't That's even pick it. up your hands. Can y'all say That's more it. about that because mm-hmm. the, I'm hearing ritual. I'm hearing the, the, the ritual oh, well, no. the ceremony, right? That so, is consistent that you have to do to That's break it. So, free, to protect your spirit, yeah. but to, to elevate your spirit. So, can y'all talk more about that? I play ball. You play ball. Mm-hmm. You ran track. <clears throat> what hoping is funny because you got your season. You have your regular practice during the season, but at certain points during the season, the ritual of practice doesn't necessarily enhance you individually. It enhances a cohesive unit. Right. So you practice plays, you go through certain things, yeah, you shoot free throws, you do certain drills, but the majority of that you get preseason. Mm-hmm. When you get into season, now it's about fine tuning. Mm-hmm. The, when players and athletes really refine their individual skills to bring them back to the table for the greater collective is in the off season. Uh-huh. So for a hooper, you can 
shoot. I mean, like you can do pickup ball all day or whatever, but I mean, but there has to be so many hours of dedication put toward what we used to call doing the individuals. Mm -hmm. It's like I shot. No, I'm sorry. I had to make a thousand shots today. Mm -hmm. Not shoot a thousand. You may have shot two thousand, right. but you had to make, make a thousand. Yeah. And then that ritual, you shot this many from this corner in this spot this many times, and it took you three hours to complete that task. Mm -hmm. And imagine having to do that in the off season for four months. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, like, I wasn't the biggest Kobe fan. I'm just going to be honest. Mm -hmm. I was even a bigger Kobe fan after the fact because I became more aware of his work ethic. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. So, you know, they always talk about the mama mentality, mama mentality. But at the end of the day, you know, there are countless athletes that we can name that have, you know, this type of work ethic, almost insane work ethics. Mm -hmm. Jerry Rice is of the world. Mm -hmm. The Michael Jordan's of the world. Kareem. Mm -hmm. um, who, Ali. Ali. Yeah. You know. It, that is what it was. That's what it was. Jordan. So, I mean, Jordan. I mean, like, yeah. the ritual meant that you had to do this thing that someone may think is trivial. Yeah. Hours and hours upon hours yeah. for that one moment in the game where folks are like, "Oh, that was a trick shot." Folks would be like, "Oh uh, no, he he's been practicing that." Well, and that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a there's a video of like some regular person who's been saying that they could do what Serena Williams does. <laughs> okay, and so then like you know they try to like let's say it's like hit a can at the you know the other end of the court. She like I mean like you could money right every time. That's the part that I think that people don't quite get is that the ritual is for the accuracy, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like that, like it, they literally have very specific skills. So you would hear that, like with Ali, it's not just that he had a jab; he had an accurate jab. Mm -hmm. He had a straight jab. So, like you're trying to, you have like there's a specific, like micro accomplishment before you win the match. Come on. Right? So that's the part that people like don't quite understand. You know? Um, it's just amazing. But yeah, you're um, you're practicing so that you can be accurate and precise. Like Kobe so you can would do it when you want it. Yeah, I was gonna say like Kobe would often say like if Shaq was in shape, uh -huh. he would have won ten championships. Right. What he's essentially saying, if he was disciplined to get, in the, to get in and work on certain things. That's it. Making those free throws. Making those free Thank you, man. He could have done that. He could have done that. He could have done it. And that's the thing. Like, an athlete believed. Like, that was Jordan. The point of his mother didn't call. He believed he could do it. That's right. So he made that happen. You know? And so I love in that documentary when he says, somebody asked him something about missing a shot. And he's like, why would I spend time worrying about that? Yeah. <laughs> You know, like, why would I even do that? Yeah, and then he all, he also practiced visualization along with yes. the ritual. Right. I saw myself hitting this. That's it. Yeah. Ali, I knew I was great before I ever won a thing. And people would say that, like, when they weren't impressed, okay, because I mean, he literally just came up to him at something. He was already calling himself a champ. Yeah. He meant that. Yeah, he meant it. He meant it. I was talking to him earlier before we showed up with Kali because we have conversation about Malcolm mm -hmm. and she was saying she's like yeah you know one of my buddies or whatever you know like he's not a scout or nothing but you know but it's, it's but but he carries a part of Malcolm with him you know he just mentioned Malcolm and then she's like well you know I know you Malcolm X Scott he's written on Malcolm and done all this stuff giving talk she said well, what is it I said you know it's funny because it was something that even folks from the generation from Malcolm was from and even the folks from prior to they could see it because it had always been there, but we never got an opportunity to really put it on full display. You know, like the ability to do that thing that had been done so well, but we would never get credit or acknowledged for, but we had been practicing this thing, doing this thing. Mm -hmm. I kind of like think about it with respect to kind of like my grandmother's cooking or something. Mm -hmm. Then you get some other cooking and be like, oh, this is award winning and be like, this ain't that ain't it. shit. Yeah. Like that ain't nothing. Like right. this here, this woman been doing this since she was, 10 having to take care of younger brothers and sisters right. or whatever like this is that thing it's like right. so with Malcolm it was like yeah what you see personified with him in terms of what many of us have been doing in terms of practice and ritual has been done with repetition even if we didn't want to do it mm -hmm. working factories you mm -hmm. know cars things of this nature yeah. whatever like even if you but you knew how to do it to perfection yeah. so you see Malcolm up here and it's like oh yeah like this is like the literal embodiment of the best of us because this thing that you see, this isn't just something that he came up with on the spot. 
Mm-hmm. He's been working on this thing. That's it. He's been yeah. researching this thing. Yeah. He's been engaging in this living craft. This He's air. been living this thing. Yeah. And then you get to see the best of who we are personified in someone who's gifted. Yeah. yeah. But that's yeah. the thing like we try to tell these students. You can't just I make this look easy. Come on. You can't just do this. No. You know. So right, if I told you that I want eight hundred words, you need to write about twenty four hundred and then cut back. I might be able to just bang out eight hundred because I have written fifty thousand. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, so I've worked on that. But what you're seeing in front of you is the product of work. Well, you know what's funny? With us, and Shell, you and I have talked about this before, but, you know, the phenomenon that's so damaging with respect to black intelligence, but it's, it's the, um, it's the, um, kind of like this piece around so-called white authority. Folks may not even get questioned, white folks may not even get questioned about how they've done it. It's just an assumption that it could be done because they yeah. were able to do it because they white. Yeah. But with us, it's like, oh, yeah. you got PhD? Yeah. Like we snuck in That's somewhere. It. That's it. And won it, it. On, you know, on a, on a prize. And yeah. it's like, oh, you wrote a book? Yeah. I yeah. Wrote, but yeah, I had, but I had to like get my behind kicked over and over yeah. again yeah. with multiple drafts. Now, like it is like no one gave this That's to me. It. I, had my, I may make it look easy at this point. That's it. But you need to look at them hours of practice. That's right. That's right. And it's like, yeah, you and need 2,400 words. That's it. Yeah. And the thing that gets me, too, is that like while you're telling them that these are the things that you need to do, you don't understand the benefit of my generosity because I'm not trying to act like this is just genius. Come on. Right? That Come it on. just happened. Mm-hmm. I worked on that. <clears throat> and if you work on it, you can too. Yes, ma'am. And that's a part of the difference. You know, like those white folks who are teaching you, they want you to think that they're geniuses. Oh, no doubt. Right? And that you can't have that. Right, because yeah, this can. is so special. <laughs> and I'm the only one that can be able to do this. That's it. Because it's up on high. That's it. Mm-mm. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. But a part of the ritual is learning how to connect to that divine in yourself. You know, because it's there. You know? Yeah, I've asked my students, um, we was reading a work on Asa Hilliard. Yeah. It was um it was talking about um being able to like identify and really tap into as an instructor the genius of children. Yes. And it was essentially he was saying that, you know, and there was a part of kinda like this like four or five tier breakdown, but he was essentially saying that, you know, you need to tell children that they're geniuses. Yeah. So at certain points of the semester, you know, I just asked my students, how many of you growing up were told that you're geniuses? Yeah. Out of a class of about 21, 22 kids, I may get maybe two hands that'll go up. Wow. And then I just think to myself, I'm like, huh. So how many of you now think that you're geniuses? All right. A few more hands go up. Wow. And I said, well, you know, that's actually going to be a part of the problem. Yeah. But I've taken an assessment. I know where we have to go from here. But I said, but the mere fact that you all are here and have beat the odds. Yeah. beyond what anybody would have ever had thought about you means that you're geniuses. Yeah. So now let's tap into the divine. That's it. Let's tap into what it is yeah. that makes you a genius. Mm, that's and then, it. you know, when they sit there like, and I'm not going to know y'all still doubt it. Yeah. But it's there. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. the thing that I've been doing now, um, I've been working with archives because Tiffany sort of believed that, okay, if we just put it digital, Right then, now it's accessible, and mm. these kids have been in the digital world their whole lives, mm-hmm. so they'll know what to do. A part of this stuff about not knowing how to do things on Zoom or not being good at it is that they don't know how to make a space sacred. That's going to be uh, that's not going to be annoying. Oh, that's going to be annoying. Yeah. Wait, annoying or active? Just active. Disruptive. That's- I'm, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, but I'm fine with it because it is what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm totally fine with okay, it. Okay, okay. I'm totally cool. fine with cool, it. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. We're at the movement lab. Things are moving. Cool. Yeah. Um, Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. But the thing that I realize is that they don't know how to make a space safe. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm. So a part mm-hmm. of what I learned over the years when they would go to archives is that they felt that their intellectual work for the first time had been dignified. Mm. And a part of that was because, and I don't know that you could do this in a majority white space, right? Because when you have to put your bags away and somebody looking at you and they telling you what you can and cannot have, mm-hmm. it feels like anywhere else black people go. 
But when they would go into the Woodruff archive, okay, on, you know, in the AUC, mm -hmm. and somebody's like, okay, put your bag over here, mm -hmm. but then come into this space, tell me what you want, mm -hmm. and I'll bring it to you. Mm -hmm. They felt important, mm -hmm. okay? When they roll that little card out. They, they, they roll that card out. They gloves on. Whatever you want, mm -hmm. you know, you just let me know. And so it's like, okay, at first it was, dang, I gotta go to this. And then it became, okay, I went back five times, mm -hmm. okay? So a part of what I've been saying to them is now what you have, a part of what we take from that practice, that experience, <clears throat> is what you've got to do is you've got to translate that experience, that ritual, into the digital space. Mm. So we know how to do it, right? So like if, okay, right now, you know, you had, you know, some artifacts from Malcolm, you would position yourself so that you could take that seriously. Come on. It might not even be that you're sort of aware of it, but you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So a part of like with Miles, my, uh, my son, when we went digital, the first thing my husband and I said was, you have got to wear your uniform, right? Like you have to dress, you have to present yourself. He wasn't on Zoom, but what we wanted him to do and to understand is that this is serious work and it requires an orientation towards it that is also serious. Right? So, right, like you in your bedroom, in your, but no. So, what we, like, what that's a part of what we did with these archives. You did, you just did some, um, you, you made meaning of something for me. You finna crack up, both of y'all finna crack up. So, I'm, um, I'm in grad school and I'm ABD at this period. Mm -hmm. And I had been in and out of New York, in and out of New York, sometimes for pleasure. Then when I realized, oh, I gotta actually do some work here too. Then it was like, Oh, there are at least four repositories that you can go in out of, and one is at this building you walk by a dozen times in Schomburg. Right. So now I'm doing data collection. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because, especially if you had relatives or family, elders, et cetera, who actually have this, this crystallized notion or perception of who you are, mm -hmm. they haven't been able to evolve beyond this point. You still this 13, 16, 20 year old kid or whatever who was doing this thing and never moving beyond. So they never really gave you growth or room to evolve. Mm -hmm. And it happens. Yeah. So in this instance, I'm in the Schomburg, so I get a call from my cousin. Mm -hmm. So I step out, and I'm doing all of what it is that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, with all the archives set out of whatever, all of the boxes, whatever that I've reserved, and I'm looking at this particular one with the folder out, with my camera here, mm -hmm. notes here, and everything else. It's because this is a part of like the literal That's practice nice. in terms of being able to engage information. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I get the call, so I'll go back into Rich Benson mode. I'm not in <laughs> the academic mode. Right. I step outside, take the call. My cousin, he was like, cuz, oh, I'm like, what up, what up? And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you know if it's an IHOP in Harlem? I'm like, yeah, it's on uh, 135th and uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, I said, actually, I'm down the street right now. Mm -hmm. He was like, oh, okay, yeah, well, what you doing down the street? I said, I'm in the, um, in the archives and library doing data collection. He said, oh, the archives, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, I said, uh-huh. Cool, well, digger, let me go ahead and get back to the other because I got some stuff to do. Right. Uh, but yeah, but it's on 135th and Douglas, whatever, right. right on the corner. But yeah, I'm gonna holler at you later. Yeah. When I talk. And he was so taken back. He was like, uh, 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 all right. I'm like, all right, cool, I'm gonna talk to you later. Click. Right. And right. I step back into the space yeah. because whether I acknowledged it directly, I was engaged in something. That's it. That was not only, it made meaning, but it was all of what you said. It was like, I, you know, I positioned myself, I got my stuff, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I was doing all of those things. And I said, and really what I was feeling was, how dare you? Yeah. How dare you take for granted that I could not be involved in something as important as I am involved That's in? That's it. Right. I'm like, no one disrupts you when you're in the studio That's right. working on said beat or whatever. That's it. Right. Now I'm in that space. That's it. Right. But for you, it was like, yeah, right. Right. Oh, yeah. You just made meaning of that for me. And sure. what you have to do, like, a part of what I realize is that you have to teach that. You, you do. do. Because I think you sort of, like, in the physical, well, before we were forced to sort of recognize what the digital could do, mm -hmm. you could take it for granted mm -hmm. that, you know, okay, well, like, you will go to this thing and be transformed by the practice. Mm -hmm. But that was information. 
Mm -hmm. That was data, mm -hmm. like, right? Like that was an experience of how you make something holy, mm -hmm. how you dignify a mm -hmm. practice, right? So a part of then, like to, to ask students to translate. So what I said was, well, so now when you're at home and you're looking at this digital archive, what you understand is it might be that there needs to be a practice where you put away the other things, right? Just like you locked up your bag, oh, yeah. right? You eliminate the distractions. You weren't in your pajamas. You had to put on clothes and they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a suit, mm -mm. right? But it might be, it's not, it's something else. So <laughs> to that point, and just to understand like really the sacred with respect to information and what it actually means to identify something that's an artifact that, you know, was worthy of being archived. Mm -hmm. I tell students about my time in the National Archives. Mm -hmm. So, okay, the Schomburg is this thing. The Woodruff is this thing. Mm -hmm. Arbor Avenue, you know, is its thing. Like, you know, Emory, great mm -hmm. archives. Yes. But Rose. I said, but go to the National Archives. Mm -hmm. And I said, whatever data that you collect and you want to get that, you know, whether it's digitized or in this case, like physical copies or whatever, I said, they actually make you coming in, put your personal belongings in a bag. They zip the bag. It locks. It has to go through one portal. Someone expects it. Then it goes up a chute. Then you mm. actually meet it when you go up that elevator to whatever floor that you're going to. <laughs> Once you get it, then they take it out and you have to verify the belongings coming out. Mm. Then I said, but that process actually... Is, is you coming in and when you go out. Yeah. I said, because it's a literal federal offense. Yeah. If you do steal something coming out of this space, and it comes not only with the fine, but also prison time as well. Wow. I said, so they're letting you know that not only is this space sacred, yeah. but what's in here yeah. is sacred. That's it. The approach to what you just said, you like my presentation, my adjustment yeah. to the space in terms of gaining, you know, yeah. um, access to knowledge. It should be different yeah. because of what's here. Well, and, yeah. listen, and I tell those children, and that's why it matters to me that you do good work. Because any time that I'm spending any time with you, Come it's on. my real time. Come on. Okay? It's real. Yeah. So all of that holiness that I know how to make, I'm giving to you. Yeah. and Because I, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do it. But when I'm doing it, I want to do it well because yeah. it, it's real time. Yeah. And you can't get it back. So there's three minutes I'm about to look at this paper. I wanted to give. You know, it's real. Yeah. So like a part of what we're teaching is, you know, um, the benefit of being taken seriously. Teaching them to appreciate that. Not being pretty and cute and fly and fun. Being taken seriously. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, because I was, um, and I talk about this often, especially with my peers now. Men and women, I'm always saying... You know, one of the worst things that I could identify now as an adult is a grown clown. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and they, you know, and we laugh because we understand it, but when we see it, we essentially are talking about necessarily how you look, mm -hmm. and even, you know, presentation, all the other stuff, whatever. But we're really talking about, can you enter into a space and be taken serious? That's it. So, you know, That's back it. to the Malcolm stuff, whatever. And they're like, okay, well, what is it in terms of this point of attraction? They're like, well, brother, you're not a Muslim, are you? I'm like, mm-mm. Mm -hmm. They're like, you're not any of these things. I said, well, what is it? I said, because, yeah, you get all the cool poses. He's highly intelligent everything. You know, he has gravitas, high level of charisma. But I said, nothing about him when you see him mm -hmm. will lead you to believe that he's anything less than serious. That's it. That's it. Period. That's it. I said, whether you're looking at him at a podium, on a podium, mm -hmm. and giving a lecture, classroom, speaking, I said, there is like laser sharp seriousness that's for this it. presentation. That's it. And I said, that's something that mm -hmm. I don't think many of us really understand in terms of us developing presence with yeah. what we do. Well, yeah. and I think it's the thing that we take for granted in excellence because mm. even if mm. it like if it is entertainment, right? Like an entertainer, like a, a Beyonce. Yeah. She's serious. Come on. You know, I mean that's serious work. Like when she told that boy to put the camera down. Listen, yeah, you, that's it. Uh, you win it right now. That's like put it. Right, put the phone down. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but but all of those athletes that they were that's dedication. Mm -hmm. That's serious work. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I appreciate about it. Oh, yeah. You know, like it's the seriousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and learning to see that. Mm -hmm. So a part of what we're doing too is teaching people how to see that. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. So it's all teaching. And then, and I would even argue that so many of us don't see our seriousness. 
Mm-hmm. Like we don't see our seriousness as young people. Yeah. We don't see mm-hmm. our, you know, the, our trajectory at every point of its maturation mm-hmm. is something that's to be taken serious. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I certainly didn't know how to claim it until later. Same. I mean, I did understand, Same, yeah. uh, and it's why I stopped running track, is because I did understand that the thing that I wanted most was my time. I understood that. Yeah. Uh, and then, it, you know, I, I was not, I didn't like competition. Well, I won't even say I didn't like competition. Um, I like competition. I didn't like running. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was just good at it. Yeah. You know? oh, I get that. Yeah. yeah. And so just because you're that. good at something doesn't mean that's what you want to do. Yeah. I used to struggle all the time with like whether or not it was a curse. Mm. You know, because yeah. it, it wasn't like I could run the 100. Mm. It was like the 400 hurdles. Mm. So it was so painful. Mm. Mm. So, um, you know, it's like, I don't know if this is a punishment. Plus, you were at a, you at a top... Yeah. Right, so this is a job. That's it. Twenty four hours. That's it. Right. And I was like, I'm not feeling this like yeah. this. I didn't I didn't want this phase of my life to look like that. This is about me getting closer to being able to ideate. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Y'all. Mm-hmm. Y'all. Y'all. What's up? <laughs> okay. 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 I'm i I'm circling things as I'm hearing and well, A, we're at time. I mean, we're going to keep going, but okay. y'all can um, dip. But um, before you do, let me just tell you what I heard and how it's fed me mm-hmm. and how I will be putting it in context. It's this intrinsic motivation that stands out that um, makes me think that, you know, this this movement of meditation that I'm doing, it, it is purposeful. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to unlock that some more, but it was that being the best comes from you that that understanding that ritual is not breaking your spirit but it's, this is um divine work a spiritual work um, something about um even in in the work that i'm doing I, I say nothing about blackness it is just there um and i say nothing about race but only about loving self and loving a black woman and seeing that in in its in, in its space and I heard about um, that thunder and lightning and that mm. that boxer that internal gauge that's happening mm-hmm. that um, what must be what must they be thinking and um, and how that ritual practice allows for undoing mm-hmm. or stitching or mending mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and to find that accuracy and mm-hmm. needing that one moment to just you know to, to pop off and I'm also hearing that you know, even in digital digital space, that there there can still be a ritual of mm-hmm. sacredness and mm-hmm. seriousness mm-hmm. Um, um, for folks to enter once they you know, p- put on the goggles, turn on the headset, mm-hmm. uh, or and to mm-hmm. see. But even coming into the lab, the movement lab, and seeing how uh, we intentionally have ushers putting people in the parking having them come and sit mm-hmm. down first to take off your shoes, mm-hmm. to carry your shoes and go and put them into the, the seat to um, uh, to set that tone of how they're entering our space um, before they see or witness the work. Um, and then going back to the, the, the first conversation about being cool, mm-hmm. and chasing those ideas of coolness mm-hmm. and the, with that black physicality and Yeah, I um, I have a lot. I have a lot to chew on. Um, we're gonna be doing these conversations again on Wednesday with Dr. Height and Dr. Vincent, and we'll be joining. Um, we'll be bringing in Kebby Williams, the saxophonist, to join in the conversation, and then on Friday we'll be bringing in um, with Kebby and um, Dr. Height and Dr. Benson, we're gonna be bringing in uh, Madie Cooper. Uh, Dr. Madie Cooper, Cooper is a performer in the work. And she's also a chair at um, Bernal University's dance department. Um, and then on Sunday, excuse me, Saturday, this Saturday, October 16th, 7.30, um, we'll have our show, uh, the second iteration of uh, Brass Wind Hot Tongues, I'm calling it, um, tongues so hot it turned brass into wind. Mm. So when we come in on Wednesday with Kebby, 
Um, I would like to start there with that title um, and see and hear and feel what you are, are seeing and hearing and mm -hmm. feeling inside of um, those titles. Um, and then on Sunday, we'll, we'll close it up with Dr. Alexandra Lockett, another radical scholar and a colleague of ours at Spelman. She gonna go in and it's not going to be nice. And I am um, I'm looking forward to that, um, that really jarring and um, um, uh, perspective that uh, Dr. Lockett, Lockett um, gives. Um, so hopefully, um, Y'all will come back and continue seeing the unfolding and how we demystify movement, how you can understand my creative process um, before I even hit a step. Um, you, you know, you come, you come to your trusted circle. Um, so thank you, thank you. Dr. Michelle Height is our director of insight. Uh, for, uh, that's her title for the company. Okay, but can you tell? <laughs> Can't you understand why she's our director of insight? You should be seeing. So uh, thank you, and my homie, Dr. Richard Vinson. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure always listening to always. you, always being at the seat or the feet of y'all, and just listening, and watching, and how you guys um, tick. I like that. Um, you might hear some noise going on, and that is um, artist and our fabricator, Miriam Robinson, downstairs putting up the art installation for our show this Friday at the Movement Lab. This is all made possible with the support of Elevate Atlanta. Um, I hope you all take a moment to um, check out um, all of the activity and engagements that Elevate has provided for our city. Um, Again, thank you all. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll see you all on Wednesday with our next Kiki. <laughs> yeah, but y'all.